And we've got um, a lot on our plates. And, um, you know, we're all sort of pandemic parenting, which is even more stressful than regular parenting. Um, we're, we're juggling a lot. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I dealt with COVID in my home um, after the holidays. So we were sort of nervous throughout the holidays about it. And then right before school went back in, everyone <clears throat> tested positive, except for me. I don't know how I got away from it, but <clears throat> it's, um, it's definitely been a challenge and, you know, juggling kids at home as well as being sick and then also work, which is always really busy in January for me, has been stressful. So I would say the reason why I'm telling you this is because I am also living um, the reality of feeding a family and um, dealing with all of the extra challenges that we are faced with right now. So I firsthand understand how hard it is to um, menu plan and make that a priority when you're also just trying to survive a lot of the time. So know that you're not alone in that and that this presentation is certainly not, um, you know, unrealistic in any way. It's, it's really, you know, I wanted to kind of come at this as a fellow parent and with compassion and understanding and relatability and maybe a little bit of humor. So I'm gonna to try to make it a little bit engaging. Um, I want everyone to sort of um, get into the mindset of, okay, like, you know, menu planning can be kind of boring to talk about, to be honest, as a dietitian. And I really wanted to make this like an engaging, fun um, presentation that you could actually take practical tools and strategies away to, to make changes and for it to make a difference in your life, because let's be honest, um, we need all the help that we can get. And um, so that's why I'm here. So a little bit of background, if you don't know who I am, my name is Sarah Remmer. I'm a registered dietitian. <clears throat> I specialize in pediatrics. And I am honored to partner with Kepler. So I have a long-term partnership with Kepler Academy. I designed the new menus that your kids are um, experiencing and hopefully enjoying at Kepler. And um, I also do lesson plans for your kiddos every week on nutrition um, and sort of work with the caregivers and teachers to make sure that the communication about nutrition and food is um, you know, food neutral and will help to build healthy relationships with food long term. So that's something that I am very passionate about. And, um, you know, I, I love being able to teach kids and parents and caregivers and teachers um, about nutrition in a fun and relatable way. And I think that, you know, the feedback so far has been really good, which is fantastic. I'm here as a resource for you. So you can always email me. Um, I am on social media every Friday. If you guys follow Kepler Academy on Instagram. So make sure you do if you don't. I'm always, um, you know, posting little strategies and tools and tips on nutrition for when you're at home. Um, okay. So with that being said, I am going to jump in and start, I'm gonna share my screen and start my presentation. So here we go. Oh yes, and for those of you who were not able to attend the last workshop, um, you can also access those slides and um, the presentation if you haven't already through Rachel. So make sure you do because there's lots of background information for the for the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Um, that was more of a general kind of feeding and nutrition workshop. Um, we talked about picky eating. We talked about building healthy food relationships. We talked about how to talk to kids about nutrition, that kind of thing. So I can certainly make those slides available if you don't have them. And Rachel has the whole presentation. So make sure that you access that. Okay, so we're talking about menu planning, tips and tricks for families. I know that um, this is my little guy, James, he's six. <laughs> um, I love this little smile that he has in this picture. 
Um, I know that, you know, it's January, a lot of us have New Year's resolutions and goals that we have made, or maybe it's a word for the year or whatnot. Um, I have no idea how many of you um, have menu planning on your New Year's resolution list or on just sort of a goal that you, you know, have had for a while. It's something that I have to admit, um, I have always struggled with. And I think that's why this presentation will be pretty relatable um, and non-judgmental <laughs> and compassionate, I guess, is because I struggle with it. Um, I'm not the most organized of people to begin with. Um, but when it comes to menu planning, I always, you know, I have, I obviously I'm a registered dietitian. I know the importance of menu planning. Um, I know that it certainly would help my life as a mom of three, single mom of three at that. Um, but it's really hard to implement. And so I've come up with a way over the past, I don't know, several years of being a mom that um, really works well for me. It also works well for a lot of my clients and readers and followers. So that's what I'm going to teach you today. So we're going to cover in this presentation why menu planning is so important, but why it's so hard to stick to, why you should scale your expectations way back and start small. So we're going to talk about starting with suppers only. Um, we're going to talk about why you should start with like five or eight different recipes and then add one new recipe each month. So this is like probably um, a lot smaller scale than you would imagine, uh, you know, a menu planning goal being, but it is, you'll see more success this way. Um, we're going to talk about the magic of batch cooking and the concept of cooking once and eating three times. And we're going to talk about why and how to get your kids involved, why it's so important and how to do that in a realistic way. And then I'm going to share with you some additional resources that I have exclusively for Kepler families that will help you along the way. Okay, first of all, I want you to use the little chat box um, and tell me what some of your biggest barriers and challenges are when it comes to meal planning for your family. So I want you to kind of think, okay, why have I struggled with this in the past? Or what are the barriers for me um, or perceived barriers as to why I haven't actually implemented a steady menu plan for our family? So go into the chat box and write down your response. I just would love to see what you have to say. One response um, that came to me privately is variety. Mm. Okay, so that would be a barrier is variety, like just not knowing what to include in terms of variety. Yep, yep. And another one um, that's come in is <laughs> um, being consistent and staying motivated and organized for sure. Those are a couple you didn't, you weren't able to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. I'm seeing lack of time. I'm seeing um, sometimes I lack ideas for meals and meal planning, unpredictability of schedules, using the ingredients I have and not buying eight different things. Yes, I totally relate to that. Anna says lack of time and variety. Juliana says lack of energy at the end of the day. I hear you. Um, different requests from different family members. Oh my goodness. Yes. Thank you, Corinne. That's like so, so the struggle is real there for sure, especially when you have multiple kids and even spouses that want different things, right? My child's palate changes every day. She will eat something one day and then refuse to eat it the next. Okay. Yeah, that's definitely something that we all experience. Um, thank you. These are great responses. Um, so we all have our own barriers and challenges, but it sounds like we all have the same ones, right? Like we're, we're all there in the same boat. I experience the same things. I will tell you right now that I am seeing more and more and more picky eating in my practice right now, um, probably because of what's going on <laughs> in our world. Um, I think that kids are really craving control um, more so than ever before, because they feel that their lives are a little bit out of control. And one way to gain control is to be very particular um, about what they would like to eat. 
And so I'm seeing that more and more. And I think too, parents are exhausted and lack energy. And so they're giving in a lot to requests. And this is something that I've um, you know, explained to families and over social media in a way that is more compassionate because I feel it too. And it's okay to have a little bit more flexibility right now in terms of um, you know, what you're offering your kids and what you're giving into because we're all just exhausted. But what's really important is remembering the division of responsibility and feeding and, and maintaining some sort of routine and boundaries when it comes to feeding. And um, if you're not familiar with the division of responsibility and feeding, I've been really diligent in making sure that the caregivers and teachers are well aware of it. Um, when they're teaching kids about nutrition and when they're feeding kids um, at mealtime. So basically what it means is parents are in charge of what, when, and where, and caregivers are in charge of what, when, and where food happens. Kids are in charge of if and how much they eat at those times. So that's really important to keep in mind. I'm going to remind you in this presentation about that too, is that you're going to get a million requests from your kids. I do all the time. And sometimes kids are upset when they don't get what they want. So I can tell you my youngest is upset if he doesn't get anything but macaroni and cheese. So no matter what I serve, <laughs> it's not going to be good enough unless it's macaroni and cheese. But of course, I can't serve macaroni and cheese every single night. Um, we all know that. And so it's just having compassion and saying, I know, buddy, I know that it's not what you want to see, but mommy decides what is served at mealtime. I know this is tough and it's okay to be sad, but this is what this is what is for dinner tonight. And you can eat it or you don't have to eat it, but this is what's for dinner and the kitchen will be closed. So just maybe practicing a little bit more compassion right now for your kids. So maintaining that boundary, but also knowing that they're going through a tough time right now and they're just trying to seek that control. And so um, a little bit more flexibility, which we'll talk about, but also just maintaining those boundaries in the feeding scenario with compassion. Okay, so a little bit of a rant, but next question I wanna ask you is, okay, now tell me how will, how will better menu planning in your family life improve your life? So how will, like, let's say you do um, figure out a way to create a menu plan for your family. How do you see that improving your life um, as a busy parent? If you want to put your responses in the chat box again, that would be awesome. Remove the mental burden of planning dinner every day. Yes, I love that. Less food waste, love it. Thanks, Chris. Cost savings, less food wasted, save time and energy looking up recipes, healthier choices, a plan to rely on, no last minute improvisation, absolutely. I love these responses. They are bang on. Thank you guys. Actually rotating some of the deep freeze items. Yes, oh my gosh, the deep freeze items that are like way in the depths of the deep freeze <laughs> that you haven't seen in years. Always feeling prepared, yeah, so less stress. I love these. These are so great, thanks guys. Excited to, I was excited about tomorrow's dinner. Yeah, it's something to look forward to. I love it. These are great, you guys. Participate in other things other than just mom duties. Yeah, so if you have a plan, you don't have to always be panicking about what you're going to make for dinner and improvising, right? You can, you know, have a plan, be prepared, and then actually spend quality time with your kids. Yeah, that's a great one. That's awesome. Thank you, guys. These are great, great responses. Um, and this is what I want to hear is I think it's really important to know your why behind it, right? I mean, it's it's all good and great to have a plan and have a goal, but why, the, the goals, you're not gonna succeed at the goal unless you know why you're doing it and how it's going to improve your life. So these are great responses. Last question, what will have to change in your life or routine for you to be successful with family menu planning? So we know what the barriers are. So what will have to change for you to actually be successful 
this might be a hard one. Oops. Let's see. Just gonna open the chat box again. My husband's input. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, you want to make sure that, you know, everybody has a chance to have some input in the menu plan, which makes a really, it makes a big difference. Start and realize it doesn't need to be perfect. Yes, I love that one. I love it. Does not need to be perfect. Have a daily routine and stick to it. Yes. Regular grocery shopping. Absolutely. You know what's really helped me, and I didn't put this in the presentation, but um, since I have been at home with the kids a lot and um, I, I am on my own with the kids, it's I've actually discovered Instacart. And I never really thought of it as an option because I really enjoy grocery shopping. But now in our new world, I'm finding that it's really hard to get out and grocery shop, <laughs> which seems ridiculous, but it just, it seems really challenging right now. And so I discovered Instacart and realized that you have, it's, there's a two week free period where you can try it out. And honestly, it's been so amazing for me because I'm able to plan ahead and um, do my menu plan and then spend the time behind my computer being careful with my choices and not just buying things because I see them at the store. Um, I often buy mindlessly and I know that a lot of people struggle with that when they go to the store. So that's really helped me. I don't know who has, you know, tried the online shopping or even just, um, you know, the click and collect. It really is a great tool. And I find that like, <clears throat> I resisted it for so long, but it's really, it's actually really helped me with my menu planning regular grocery shopping, be prepared, actually plan ahead, have a detailed shopping list. Great, great answers, you guys. And all really good things to start thinking about as we work our way through this little workshop here. Okay, so menu planning, why is it so hard? Well, it takes consistency and it takes commitment, as we all know. So creating a new habit takes time. On average, it takes about two months before a new behavior can become automatic. So it's gonna be a good you know, eight weeks of you doing this consistently um, in order for it to stick and in order to really reap the benefits of it and um, get to the point where you feel like this is part of my routine and I can't go away from it. It's just like an exercise routine or activity routine. You have to do it to the point where you see the benefits in your life and you couldn't imagine not having it. So you do have to give it time and you do have to be consistent with it. Your menu planning goal is too lofty or unrealistic. So sometimes we set out um, with any sort of goal with an unrealistic expectation of what we can actually achieve. And um, that can become very overwhelming and it can actually sabotage our goals. So um, I am like a, a very lofty thinker and I have these grandiose plans for, for many things in my life and often um, I end up feeling defeated because my expectations of myself are way too high. So an example of that is just my list for the day of things that I want to accomplish. Often we feel if we've only accomplished a few things on our list, we feel defeated by the end of the day and we feel like it wasn't a successful day when really we probably just needed to shorten our list and decrease the expectation of what we could actually achieve. So an interesting perspective. So questions to consider beforehand, which we just went through together. Um, are you putting too much pressure on yourself and setting yourself up for failure? What is your why? We talked about this, right? Is it to be more organized? Is it to help with picky eating? So this was something that came to mind today when I was thinking about this presentation is, you know, when you sit down with your family and you create a menu plan for the week and you actually include your little ones in that planning, um, they feel as though they have a hand in what is being served, even though the boundary is that you as parent decide ultimately what is served, when they have some input and when they have 
when they're able to take part in the menu planning process, there's a much, much higher chance that you'll actually have success at mealtime with them trying new foods and eating enough of those nutritious mealtime foods. So it can actually help with picky eating. And if that's a stress in your life, which it is for many parents, <laughs> it would be abnormal not to have that stress. That might be part of your why. To cut down on processed food, because when you're improvising and when you're stressed out and when you're exhausted at the end of the day and you don't have supper planned, what happens? I know for me, it's boxed mac and cheese or a frozen pizza or ordering in. And that's okay once in a while. Um, and it's, it's actually okay, you know, regularly if it's once or twice a week, I think we, we need to be realistic too. But when it becomes the norm and sort of the status quo, that's when nutrition can um, be affected. And when we don't, we start to feel kind of crummy physically. Um, so that could be part of your why is just cutting down on processed packaged fast foods cutting down on food waste. So maybe there's a bigger goal in mind, a more global goal, right? As if sustainability and cutting down on waste and improving, you know, helping the environment, that kind of thing is a goal of yours, which it should be, I think, for all of us, um, then that's a big one. Um, saving money on food. So not only the, you know, the sustainability piece of it, but also, um, you know, food waste in terms of like, money <laughs> you know like when you waste food it feels really awful right because it feels like you've spent your hard-earned money on this and it's it's just a waste so if decreasing food waste is a goal which i think it should be for all of us then menu planning is a really good goal saving time i find that um, i spend so much more time ironically on preparing meals when i don't plan ahead then if I just take the time on Sunday to do a little bit of a plan and write a grocery list and plan my groceries around the plan that we've created and just know sort of in my head, okay, this is what the week looks like for suppers, it really does save a lot of time. <clears throat> so which meal is the most challenging for you? I want you guys to write in the chat box. I'm just curious to see which meal of the day is the most challenging. And then I want you to think about why does it cause so much stress? And maybe we just start there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dinner. <laughs> yes, I would have to agree. Anyone else? Yeah, dinner. So yeah, supper for sure breakfast because no one is on their A game and wants to do any prep. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's valid. No one is on their A game. Everyone's tired. Dinner for me. Okay. Great. Yeah, I am. Um, lunch, I never have anything interesting. Okay, so it might be different for everyone that that challenging meal might be different for different people in different families and that's okay. I want you to really try to think hard about what meal is the most challenging and I just want you to start there. So I'm going to be talking about suppers because that's what I tend to see as being the most challenging for people but you can take this information and apply it to any meal whether it's breakfast, lunch or supper um, but we're going to talk about suppers okay. So I want you to start small. I want you to start with one meal a day. <clears throat> In this case, we're talking about suppers. Why did I choose suppers? Suppers tend to be the most challenging for families with young kids. It's the most involved meal, typically. Everyone is tired from their day. There's kids' activities. Supper tends to be the most varied of meals. So there's the most variety in supper meals. Um, it's typically the meal where the family eats together which is a really important aspect of it. Breakfast, lunch, and snacks tend to be simpler and more repetitive. 
So that's what the answers that I got from various families about why supper is the most challenging. I think that you guys said it in your comments too. Everyone is exhausted by the end of the day. Um, I think that especially right now, people are, um, including kids, are just mentally exhausted, physically exhausted, and um, hungry. And so it just, yeah, for everybody, it does tend to be the most challenging. So just a little bit of review here in terms of what a meal should look like. So meals, there should be three meals a day, obviously breakfast, lunch, and dinner, with at least four or five items at each meal from different food groups. So what you wanna make sure is that you have veggies and fruit, you have protein rich foods, you have whole grain foods, and then you have some healthy fats, and that would make up a balanced, nutritious meal. When it comes to serving, especially dinner, you want to make sure that there's four to five different items at the table, and you want to make sure that you're being considerate without catering to your kids. So you want to make sure that there's at least one item at the table that you know each child will enjoy. So this is just something to keep in mind when you're planning out your suppers. Um, you want to make sure that there's variety. So you want to be serving different foods for sure throughout the week. Um, it's okay to have repetition. It's okay to serve the same things as long as by the end of the week, your kids and you are getting a nice variety of foods and it does not have to be gourmet whatsoever. It could be really, really simple. So when it comes to planning out your supper meals, you want to start out with not 30 recipes or, you know, buying a cookbook and trying all of the recipes all at once, because that can feel really overwhelming. So I want you to choose five to 10 recipes that your family either loves and um, it's kind of a sure thing, you know how to make it. Um, you have the ingredients available in your house all the time. It's simple. Um, well accepted, generally speaking, from kiddos, I want you to choose five to 10. And that's it. I don't want you to go above and beyond that. And that will be the base of your menu rotation for suppers. That's where we're going to start. So I have um, some recipes that we rotate through all of the time. So I, I have a list of five or 10 um, I don't add a lot of new, unless I develop a recipe myself for my blog, I don't tend to add a lot of new recipes. It's, you know, I go through the same five or 10 recipes. My kids love them. I know how to make them. I developed them. So I know that they're nutritious and that's okay because we still have lots of variety. So familiar, tried and tested with your family, make sure they're balanced. So we talked about what a balanced meal looks like. There's four or five different items. Make sure that there's fruits and fruits and or veggies, protein rich foods, whole grains, healthy fats. Um, remember, like I said, you want to include four or five different items at least. And a bonus is that the meal can be deconstructed and served family style. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So then the next step is planning your week. So I usually do this on a Sunday. It's just part of my routine on a Sunday now where I sit down for five or 10 minutes. I'm not taking an hour out to do this. I sit down for five or 10 minutes, whichever kid is available and not at an activity, I include them in the planning and we sit down and we literally jot down on this supper planner, which I created and you guys will have access to the PD downloadable PDF um, and we just, write down ideas for meals. So you start with three or four supper recipes in this weekly planner. So every single day of the week is not going to be a new recipe that um, uh, entails you, you know, prepping, cooking. No, that's just like unrealistic. So three to four days in your week, you want to plug in those recipes. You know how I said that there's five to 10 recipes that you rotate through. Take three or four of those and plug them into your week. So take stock of what you have in the fridge and the pantry already and plug those in. And then on the other days, fill in the blanks with easy throw it together options. Okay. So things like grilled cheese, 
and veggie soup and maybe some veggies and dip. Breakfast for dinner. So whether that's pancakes and bacon and fruit or eggs and toast and fruit salad, something like that. A finger food charcuterie type supper and pre-cooked rotisserie chicken with maybe some frozen veggies that you've steamed and bread. So we're talking like super simple, balanced, but those kind of throw it together meals. We often will do things like chicken quesadillas, which take five minutes, and then a begged salad. So that's kind of a throw it together type dinner, or maybe it's French toast with Greek yogurt and fruit, something like that, that I can make in 15 minutes. Um, that's where, that's what we fill in the blanks with. So three to four recipes that you actually have to follow a recipe. It's a balanced meal. Um, it takes some time. The rest are throw it together options. And then make your grocery list from there. So you have your menu, you have your supper plan, and then you make your grocery list from there. Okay, so make your life easier by prepping as much as you can ahead of time. So things like taking meat out of the freezer and thawing it or marinating it so it's ready to go. I can't tell you how many times I have had in my mind what I want to make and then at four o'clock realize that the meat is still frozen and I have to thaw it out and I just get overwhelmed and then end up throwing a frozen pizza into the oven. So something as easy as taking the meat out the night before. So when you see your menu plan, you can plug into your phone or your calendar or whatever you have that you keep track of, you know, your daily tasks. You, you can put in there, I have to take the chicken out of the freezer and put it in the fridge for tomorrow. So little things like that, you can actually plug into your calendar. And I know it sounds really silly, but it's really important. So you have your menu plan, you have your grocery list, you've gone grocery shopping or you've ordered your groceries, and then you enter into your calendar what you need to do in order to prep. When you get your groceries, what I would suggest is washing and chopping your vegetables right away, putting them in like a Ziploc container and sticking them in your fridge. The reason why this is important is because when you're exhausted at the end of the day, the last thing you wanna do is wash and chop veggies. The last thing you wanna do is thaw meat, raw meat in the microwave and then season it and marinate it and like you just don't have time and you're exhausted and it's going to seem really overwhelming. So these little things that you can do ahead of time are really, really important. The other reason why washing and chopping veggies um, is so helpful and so key is because I often, this is one of my um, best tips I would say for the last like decade of being a dietitian and, and you know focusing on pediatrics is, the veggie tray trick. So when you're prepping dinner, whether it takes an hour or 15 minutes or whatever it is, throw a veggie tray or a plate of raw veggies and dip on the counter, on the island, on the table. Don't say anything and just leave it there. And you will notice that your kids will start flocking to it and eating veggies and dip. And this takes the, first of all, it helps with hunger, right? So kids are hungry while you're prepping meals. Often they're, you know, saying whining or complaining or asking for a snack right before dinner. I don't know how many kids in your lives ask for snacks right before dinner as you're prepping dinner. Um, I, nine times out of 10, will put the veggie tray out. So it's pre-cut, pre-washed veggies that I've, you know, I've done that on a Sunday. They're all ready to go. I stick it, you know, on the counter with some hummus or with some ranch dip or both. And I say, there's veggies on the counter. And when veggies aren't competing with other mealtime foods like bread and meat and things that kids tend to like a little bit more, then they tend to get eaten more. So your kids will munch on those veggies and it takes the stress out of trying to get your kids to eat veggies at dinner. And it also keeps them happy while you're prepping. So I would say 100% wash and chop your veggies or buy a veggie tray. There's no shame in buying a veggie tray that's already done for you and having that in the fridge for the week. Um, baked salads are my best friend. I love them. I use them all the time. They Definitely, I mean, sometimes I feel like, oh man, I really should just make my own salad, but 
it's the same thing. It's just been done for you. So if you're able to, if you have the resources to buy veggies that are already prepped for you, do it. I often go to Costco and I buy the bags of cauliflower and broccoli that are already pre-cut so that I don't have to worry about that stuff. When you're a busy mom, when you're a busy parent, um, it's okay to you know, buy those sort of convenience items um, if it helps to decrease overwhelm. Plan your day so that you have enough time to prep your meal. So plan out your day um, to make sure that you start the prep in time for activities and um, you know, so that the timing of the meals and snacks are such that they're two to three hours apart. So if it's sort of like a, an afterthought after work and after school, then often that's when the overwhelm creeps in and you end up just doing something really easy because you feel overwhelmed and busy and everyone's hungry and you're exhausted. So just planning out your day accordingly. And then consider activities and sports and how this will affect the prep time. And also consider that when you're doing your menu plan, like, okay, so-and-so has soccer and hockey that night. So that's gonna be a mac and cheese or a throw a pizza in the oven night. The other nights will focus on the recipes. Okay, so two things that I recommend when it comes to menu planning. <clears throat> is this concept of cooking once and eating two or three times. So if you're spending time preparing and cooking a meal, um, try to make triple the amount and freeze two future meals for yourself when, you know, on those busy nights when you don't have time. So things like chili, casseroles, spaghetti sauce, homemade mac and cheese, homemade hamburgers, meatballs, all of those things. Like if you're gonna spend the time to prepare these things, to, you know, to get the recipe, to get the ingredients, to take the time to prep and make it, you might as well make triple the amount, freeze two thirds of it for, few, you know, for future nights. Always, always do that. Don't, don't ever just make a meal for one night. Repurpose the protein. If you're baking, or cooking or roasting or grilling meat or poultry, make two to three times as much and repurpose it for future meals that week or later. So what I mean by this is if you're doing, let's say um, chicken breasts with roasted broccoli um, and rice, then I would make three times the amount of chicken that you normally would and save that for things like sandwiches and pizza and chicken quesadillas and chicken and veggie fried rice and chicken soup. So you're just repurposing the protein because the protein part of the meal tends to be <clears throat> the most labor intensive and the most overwhelming part of the meal, especially if you are a meat eater. Um, ground beef. So if you are making, let's say tacos, make triple the amount of ground beef that you need and save it for things like lunches and spaghetti sauce and homemade hamburger helper and baked burritos, things like that. So think about, okay, how can I repurpose the protein in this meal for future meals so I don't have to worry about the protein part? This has been a huge lifesaver for me. So types of meals to consider when you're doing your supper plan. One pan or one pot meals, these are amazing because they cut down on the mess and the cleanup that you have to deal with after. And they tend to be really simple and easy. So if you don't have one pan or one pot meal recipe ideas, I have lots and lots, and I'm gonna share them with you. Deconstructible meals, so family style meals are fantastic because they tend to be really easy. Um, and also it helps with picky eating because your kids are able to build their own meal and they feel as though they're in charge and in control. So we do family style meals most nights because they are easy and my kids love them. And um, I don't know, they really, they really do help with sort of the power struggles at the table. Finger food style snack board meals. So we do this often. It's kind of the same concept as um, like the deconstructable family style meals, but it's just all snacks. So I just put out a few sort of like charcuterie platters and this is sort of what they look like. So I just raid my fridge and obviously there's not like heart shaped cheeses all the time. That takes a lot, of, a lot of time and effort. That was for the photo shoot, but you get the idea. There's fruits, there's veggies, there's protein options, there's whole grains, a lot of cheese and crackers, a lot of veggies and hummus. 
Um, we have some protein balls there. I have some dried chickpeas. Um, you get the idea. This is okay for a meal. It's okay and it's actually really, really fun. And, and it's okay to you know, have this as your supper meal or lunch meal or breakfast meal. Breakfast for dinner, I've already said it, love it. So easy and so fun. Kids usually um, love it as well. So what about breakfast, lunches, and snacks? We talked about supper. We're starting with suppers, or that's the example that I'm giving, but what about the other meals? Remember, when you start with one meal, you're not gonna become overwhelmed. So once you master that one meal, suppers, the planning of suppers, you can move on to other meals. So once you've given it a couple months, it's become part of your routine, it's a new habit, then you can move on to other meals and snacks. Remember, suppers can easily turn into lunches too. So the leftovers from supper, like again, nine times out of 10, I'm using leftovers from supper for my kids' lunches. That's what they get, that's part of what they get in their lunches. It's easy for me, it decreases food waste, it's balanced, we're good. Keep breakfasts simple. So my rotation is oatmeal, smoothies, eggs, waffles and pancakes. And by the way, waffles and pancakes, I make a huge batch of them and I freeze them and then I just stick them into the toaster for breakfast. And that's, usually, that's often a breakfast choice of my kids is you know, leftover waffles and pancakes that have been frozen, throw a little bit, bit of Greek yogurt on it, um, maple syrup, some fruit, and you're good to go. It's also a great dinner option or a great lunch option. So that's sort of the rotation that I use. Not a ton of um, variety, I would say, but definitely enough nutrition by the end of the week. And there's enough variety that everyone's happy and it doesn't get boring. Keep lunches simple too. Um, lots of finger foods, um, bento box style lunch kits are the best for kids. There's lots of variety in color. They're easy, um, leftovers, finger foods, things like eggs and smoothies. If you're at home on the weekends, those are fine for lunches as well. Often that's what we'll have is eggs on toast with salsa or smoothies and peanut butter sandwiches. It doesn't have to be gourmet. When it comes to snacks, Kids do need opportunities to enjoy snacks in between meals. So kids need to be eating every two to three hours. So it's important that you do include snacks. Make sure that they have both protein and carbohydrates in them. I have a handout for that that I'm gonna to give to you guys. Adults do not require snacks necessarily. I rarely snack. I usually just have three meals a day. It really is a personal choice. Um, if you find that you experience hunger in between meals or if there's longer than three hours between meals, consider a nutritious snack. Okay, so just a little bit of review here. The feeding rules that we talked about, the division of responsibility in feeding. You as the parent or caregiver, you are in charge of what is served. You're in charge of when it is served. So again, kids need eating opportunities every two to three hours in order to meet their nutritional requirements by the end of the day. You also decide where it's served. And it's okay sometimes if you have a movie night and eat in front of the TV. Just don't make it a regular thing. Kids should eat without distractions most of the time. Kids are in charge of if they eat and how much they eat at meals and snacks. So there shouldn't be pressure. Um, there shouldn't be bribing. There shouldn't be any sort of strings attached to dessert. So if you're offering dessert, don't make it um, conditional um, in terms of them eating dinner beforehand. So that's a whole other presentation that we can talk about later is sweets and treats to be neutral about food we want to you know fulfill our role as the parent or caregiver and then we want to give our kids a chance to self-regulate and you know under those boundaries that we've set so we decide what when and where they decide if they eat it and how much they eat and then the kitchen is closed after so they have to wait till the next eating opportunity to fill their tummies again Talked about being considerate without catering. So making sure to offer at least one food that each child likes and accepts at the table. This could be bread, this could be rice, this could be carrots and dip, it could be apple slices. Um, you get the idea. As long as there's one thing that you know each child will likely accept, then you've been considerate without catering and making a special meal for them. Allow each child to eat at least as 
eat as much or as little of that food as they would like. Try family style meals, we've talked about this. For more selective eaters, consider a tester plate. So maybe having a plate on the side that they can put food that they're not quite ready to try or to consume on. So you're separating the safe foods from the unsafe foods for them. So what's served is served. Everyone gets offered the same thing. No one's getting a special meal. So just a little review of why family meals are so important. And this doesn't have to happen every single night. Um, if it happens a few times a week, you'll still see the benefits from it. I know that everyone's really busy. You have your own schedules. Every, you know, in some families, people are running, you know, to different activities all the time and different commitments. So it's not really realistic to think that every single night you're going to have a sit down family meal. But like I said, a few times a week really makes a big difference. So what research shows is that kids see better grades, less chance of smoking, drinking and low self esteem. Um, it can increase the chances of your child making better food choices overall and eating more fruits and vegetables. In teens, it can lower the incidence of eating disorders and feelings of depression and thoughts of suicide. And I have to say, unfortunately, um, along with a huge increase in picky eating that I've seen in my practice, we are also seeing a huge increase in eating disorders. So, um, you know, the way that the world is working, it's definitely... Um, taking its toll. So just something to keep in mind. They also lower, so family meals also lower the chance of childhood obesity, not to mention the fact that family meals provide the perfect opportunity to bond and catch up as a family. So it, it's really the time where everyone can kind of sit down and visit and catch up in your day. Sarah, we have a couple of uh, questions um, just quickly. Sure. So one comment was, what can you do if your children don't eat what you serve and they ask for a snack shortly after the meal is done? Mm -hmm. That's the first one. And there's another one after. Okay. I'll just answer that one really quickly. So um, that's a really good question. If you have a child that does not want to eat what is served, that is okay. That is their decision. You've done your job. You've offered four or five different things in that meal. It's nutritious and balanced. And after that, it's up to them. Um, you do have to hold your boundary that the kitchen is closed afterwards and make sure that you give them lots of warning of that. So you can say something like, that's okay that you don't wanna eat this meal, but the kitchen will be closed and there won't be anything else offered for two to three hours. So if bedtime, fall, if bedtime falls, within two hours of supper time, then really there shouldn't be a bedtime snack offered. So that's something that you'll have to decide. Um, that's what I recommend is that you don't offer a bedtime snack if, if um, bedtime is shorter than two hours away from supper, if that makes sense. If it's longer, you can offer a bedtime snack, but you need to give kids two to three hours in between meals for them to build that appetite. If they're asking for something directly after supper, then they've probably gotten into the habit of knowing that that's an option. So if kids are refusing what's served at dinner and they're asking for a snack half an hour later and you're giving into that and saying, sure, what would you like? Then in future, they're gonna know, I don't actually have to eat dinner because I know I'm gonna get a snack half an hour later if I ask for it or if I whine for it or if I beg for it. So it's compassionately holding that boundary, giving lots of warning and saying, this is what is for dinner. There's no other foods. These are what's offered. You would need to fill your belly because we are not going to have another opportunity to eat until right before bedtime. Um, so make sure that your tummy gets what it needs in order to be full until the next time we eat or in order to be satisfied until the next time we eat. So lots of warning, lots of repetition, and then holding that boundary compassionately. So even when you, you communicate that, and they still come to you half an hour later saying something like, I can see that you're upset and I can see that you're hungry. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that your tummy is hungry right now? And what did mommy say about, um, you know, the kitchen will be closed. And so the kitchen is still closed and there's nothing to eat. And I know that you're gonna be sad and that's okay. The kitchen will reopen in two hours. What would you like to do until then? 
and there's going to be crying and there's going to be whining and there's going to be complaining, especially if kids have um, gotten used to having that option of having that snack afterwards. So it takes time and consistency and holding those boundaries. Hope that helps. That's excellent. Yeah. And uh, another question was around vegetable prep. So that veggie, the veggie trick, the veggie tray trick you have. Yeah. Um, just wondering about um, if veggies, you know, tech would taste old if you wash and cut them a few days earlier or if you pre-cut them. So how can you kind of avoid or keep them fresh, I guess, is a good question. Mm, that's a really good, really good question. I, um, it depends on the vegetable. So I shop at Costco and I buy the mini carrots. They're actually carrot sticks and they stay fresh for a good week. Um, so I'm like very particular with what I choose uh, because I wanna make sure that they're easy, they're prepped, I don't have to worry about it. Things like cucumber, I do cut right before I serve them because they do sort of get a little bit dry and um, not as appetizing. But things like carrots, they do tend to keep. Um, baby carrots are a nice option because they're already washed and prepped for you. Things like, um, I find pepper, like peppers, those little mini peppers, I buy those at Costco as well because they're, they're already kind of bite-sized. Um, snap peas are great because again, they're usually washed and they're the right size. You don't have to cut them up. Um, things like broccoli and cauliflower, they keep for quite a while. So you can have them in the fridge for, you know, three or four days and they're usually pretty good. I'm trying to think of what else. But yeah, there's some veggies that you really do have to prep right before. And I find cucumbers being one of those. And that's one of my, my kids' favorites. I find that those easier to just like really quickly slice them up before I serve them. A couple of other questions popped up. Um, at what age should we start implementing the two to three hour meal snack gaps? That's a really good question. So. Um, I would say at when you start introducing snacks, so when you've stopped breastfeeding or nursing, and actually, I mean, it starts before then. So usually what happens when you start solids is there's, you know, a solid feed, and then there's a breastfeed or a formula feed or a bottle feed, and, and then there's another solid feed. So really it starts at six months. Um, and those I guess milk feeds turn into snacks when they when your baby turns one year, right? So really from one year of age, it's two to three hours. And then when kids get older, um, so sort of like, I would say eight to nine years old, depending on their activity level, they sometimes can go four hours in between. Um, but I would say as a rule of thumb, two to three hours is a good uh, schedule for kids because they have small stomachs but big energy needs. And especially if they're going through a picky eating phase or if they're going through a growth spurt, they do need those opportunities, but they still need the gap in between where only water is offered so that they can gain that appetite and learn how to self-regulate at mealtimes. So maybe what I'll do is, um, is just quickly finish up the presentation then answer any more questions that we have. Um, okay, so involving kids in food prep and planning, lots of benefits. Um, it, it really doesn't, sometimes it seems overwhelming to involve your kids and it might seem like everyone has different ideas of what they wanna see. But when, again, when kids have input, they're more likely to actually eat well at meals. Um, and also, you know, kids helping can, can help with math and reading. Um, build self-esteem, hone kitchen skills, and teach about diversity. Oops. So I actually have a handout for you guys on various ages of kids and how they can help, different ideas of how they can help in the kitchen. Um, so I just kind of repurposed it here for these slides, but I actually have a handout that you can print off and stick in your kitchen somewhere. And we are at the end of the presentation. Um, I wanted to show you guys what I have for you in terms of resources. So I'm gonna do that really quickly and then I will answer any more questions that are left. Um, so I wanted to find a way where I could house 
resources, menu plans, recipes, that kind of thing for Kepler families exclusively um, that was protected. So it's password protected. It's only for Kepler families. Please don't share um, uh, because these are actually resources that I um, sell and I'm offering them to Kepler families for free. Um, and what did I say here? Oh yes, please let me know if there's anything else that you'd like to see on this page and I will do my best to help out. So I'm just gonna show you how to access this private page on my website for Kepler families. So here is the link and um, I can send this to you if you if you can take a screenshot of this right now or I can send it to you, but it's my website, sarahremmer.com. Um, forward slash Kepler Academy Nutrition Resources. And then the password is Kepler with a capital K. So I'm just going to click this here. I hope you guys can still see my um, screen. So here's my website. Here is the page. And actually, I'm already logged in. So, but um, if I wasn't, you'd have to put in the password. It's Kepler. And you'll see here that. I have put the slides for today's presentation here in case you wanted to look at them. So it's just sort of a PDF that will pop up and all of the slides are here. And then I also have um, my a four week sample menu plan. So this is breakfasts, snacks, lunches and dinners. And there's four weeks written out for you. Um, lots of, well, they're all my recipes that I've created. And so they're all tried and true with my kids. Some of my most popular recipes on my website. Um, you'll see that with some, it might be hard to see here, but with some of the recipe or with some of the ideas here, there's a recipe attached to it. I have a whole recipe book for you guys with all of these recipes. So you'll see that there's four weeks and then there's actually an empty template at the bottom where you can make your you can print this out and make your own menu plan so is that um, there's my recipe booklet so these are all the recipes that you'll find in that menu plan um, they're all written out here all in one document again they're all like tried and true really easy simple recipes nutritious they you know contain those four to five different items um, there's lots of snack options in here too. Some of these, actually a lot of these recipes, your kids um, have tasted them at Kepler already. So that's kind of fun. You can make them at home with your kids. And then I have the supper planning template that I showed you that you can print off and use because I do highly recommend that you just start with suppers or at least just one, one meal a day. Um, I have a printable here that just shows sort of what a balanced meal looks like um, and then examples of all of the different items in that little balanced meal template or um, graphic that I give you here. So fruits and veggies, add a whole grain, add a protein, so you can kind of mix and match the different ideas here. And then I have kids snack list. So these are just ideas of kids snacks. Um, I just have this up on my fridge and I kind of refer to it when I'm feeling brain fog and don't know what to serve. My kids can choose. Um, sometimes I give them structured choice and say, here are your choices, this one or this one, and they get to choose which one out of the two choices. Um, so that's kind of nice. And then if you are stumped on school lunches, I have lots of ideas in this handout as well. So this is something that I um, also have in my kitchen and I refer to when I just am out of ideas. So I just wanted to give you guys access to those um, to help with this menu planning and ideas and give you some new recipes to try out if you um, would like to add to your five to 10 recipes that you'll rotate through. And then, like I said, try to add, you know, keep your goal really attainable and try to add one new recipe a month. Don't try to add a whole bunch of new recipes because you'll feel overwhelmed. Um, I hope that that was helpful, you guys. I hope that you could take um, a few little strategies and tools away with you tonight to help you with your menu planning. And I'm happy to answer any more questions that you have. 
So I don't know. Let me just. See. There were two more that popped up. Um, one from Claire saying that her child will eat fruit until it's gone and will eat more if given more. So do we keep offering more fruit? And then one more from Jessica after that. Okay. Yeah. Good question. I have a daughter who is the exact same way. She's like a bottomless pit with fruit. And so what I would say is um, offer fruit regularly. So at least, you know, two or three times a day offer fruit. Um, I think that, yes, absolutely. If, um, if a child is asking for more of one of the components in a meal or snack, it's totally fine to offer more. I think that there does need to be sort of a limit. Um, in when I say limit, I just mean if you, um, here's an example. My kid, my daughter Lila loves fruit and she would eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. But I also need it for smoothies in the morning and I need it for lunch packing the next day. So when it becomes um, you know, a scarcity issue. And, you know, you want to make sure that everyone gets their share and that you have enough for future meals. And you can say, you know what, this is all that's offered um, at lunch today. Um, they ate, you know, they had their fill, they had lots, you know, lots of opportunity to eat it, but you do need to save some for future meals. That's okay to say. That's not limiting. It's not restricting. It's just basically like, we need smoothies in the morning and we need lunch for tomorrow. So I do need to save some of this fruit for then, but here's what's offered for um, the lunch meal. So there, there can be sort of a limit, but if there's more to offer at that meal and, and they want more fruit instead of more rice or meat, it's okay to give them more. So kids could, should be able to eat as much as they want of the foods that are offered at the meal, if that makes sense. Excellent. And um, one of the last questions, what do you recommend to do when the child who doesn't eat the meal then tries to sneak into the fridge or pantry for a snack? <laughs> That's a good question. Tries to sneak into the pantry or fridge for a snack. Um, yeah. Okay. So I have an 11 year old who I, I can relate to this question because he will try to do that. And so it's again, compassionately saying, the kitchen is closed. Um, you know, we had our chance to eat at mealtime. It will reopen at this time. So you're not, you know, you certainly don't. One parent actually asked me, like, do I put a lock on the fridge or the pantry? No, um, but it's just compassionate reminders. No, the kitchen's closed. Um, what would you like to do instead? Do you have homework to do? Would you like to read? Um, have you had screen time? Do you want to watch a show? That kind of thing. So just redirecting them and saying, no, the kitchen's closed. So it's okay to hold your boundary. You're not being restrictive. You're not starving your child. You're, it's it's mealtime boundaries are really, really important for kids. They need those boundaries in order to learn how to self-regulate. Otherwise, if the kitchen was open, it would just be a free for all and kids would be snacking all day and they would lack nutrition by the end of the day because snack foods don't tend to be as nutritious. So if kids are always sort of at neutral and neither hungry nor full because they've been snacking all the time, then um, their nutrition will suffer for sure. And it's gonna be totally chaotic for them. So they do need those gaps in between. And kids, when they come to the meal hungry, they are more likely to try those foods because they're hungry and they don't have any other options. So even though you're being you know, considerate without catering and you're offering lots of variety, kids are more likely to eat that food um, if they come to the table with a hungry tummy. So there's been so many times when my youngest James will, and especially lately, like it's been really challenging where he will just cry and be upset and whine at whatever choice I've chosen for that meal. So he'll come in and he'll see that I'm making whatever it is and he'll be very upset and it wasn't what he wanted. And I cannot tell you the amount of times where I'm just like, it's okay, buddy, you don't have to eat, but this is what's for dinner. So you, you don't have to eat anything. He comes to the table, he has a frown on his face, and then he ends up eating. So when the pressure is taken off, when you hold your boundary, it's amazing what will happen. Kids will adapt. Um, and you know, if they've been used to having an open-ended kitchen where they have access to the pantry and fridge, whenever um, it's going to take a lot of communication. It's going to take a lot of compassion and understanding and patience. 
Um, but it's really important that you start setting those boundaries. Maybe you have a family um, meeting where you sit down and you just say, listen, this is, you know, what's going to happen now. Mom and dad are in charge of what, when and where food happens. You guys to get to decide when, or sorry, if and how much you eat at mealtimes, but the kitchen is, cl is closed in between. And so that's the new rule, that's the new boundary. We will continue to remind you of that. Um, there's no random snacks throughout the day. So I, I always suggest that having a family meeting when everyone's calm and you're not around food just to communicate that so everyone's on the same page. One last question, and I think it's really good. Um, if your kid refuses to eat, do you make them stay at the table while the rest of the family eats? Mm. I like that. So um, yes and no. If your child has decided that they are not going to eat what is being served, then you can say something like this. That's okay that you don't want to eat, but we're going to stay at the table for family time. And what I suggest is having a minimum of 10 minutes where everyone sits at the table for family time, whether that's two people at the table or six people at the table. Um, it's really important that kids have the chance to sit down and catch up and talk to you and um, you know talk about their day at school or, or daycare or whatever. So I would say a minimum of 10 minutes and you can have a visual timer if that's a challenge. So I have sand timers on in my Amazon shop, I have a visual timer as well where you can see the time that's left over so that kids, kids sometimes like, because they don't really have a concept of time when they're younger. So having a sand, like a colorful sand timer can kind of help and just say, you know what, that's okay that you don't want to eat, um, but we're going to stay at the table for family time until the sand timer runs out. And it's a minimum of 10 minutes. Um, so I guess, to answer your question, it's not, you're not punishing your child by making them stay at the table, but it's more focusing on family time than get my kid to eat time, I guess. Perfect. That was it. Okay, great. Well, I really appreciate you all for joining me tonight. Again, I hope that that was helpful and you were able to take something away from it. And um, I, I hope the resources are helpful to you as well. If you have trouble accessing them, um, let me know, let me know, and we will also save the presentation for whoever wasn't able to make it tonight. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> have a wonderful night.